I've had opportunities last uh, several years to visit with groups of farmers such as yourself or uh, many venues. I really appreciate the fact that I don't have to drive 100 miles to go <laughs> talk someplace. I was put together uh, some selections of some a uh, couple other presentations. So what I intend to do is to uh, go through some of these. Some of this information is old, but it's applicable. Uh, some of it you've probably seen before, uh, but uh, this should be fairly interactive. So if you see something that you have a question about, you know, stop and ask what's going on. Okay. This first little series of slides is just an indication of how, uh, what a tough environment we're living in. Is we've got to make up this volume of water from something other than groundwater or pumping, pumping capacity. And that's typically done from two, two avenues. One is rainfall. And the other is, is stored water in the profile. So you have uh, an opportunity to have water stored in the profile during the winter months, uh, pre-plant irrigation, so on and so forth. And one strategy that we typically have used, and it's, it's a good strategy, is to uh, irrigate uh, this early irrigation period. You know, prior, prior to the time that you've got uh, your demand is lower than your pumping capacity. You've got a, a period of time in there where you can apply water to, and store water in the profile. Uh, but the, of course, the unfortunate part is that that's during that extremely high evaporative demand period. And uh, we have found that it's extremely difficult to get water in the ground during that time period. Okay, we're going to go back several years. Uh, to an irrigation study that we did. This is, uh, and the, point, the part that I want to talk about is uh, pre-plant uh, irrigation. This, this was uh, uh, something that was triggered off of a comment by a producer uh, several years ago. We wanted to look at and try to measure the uh, amount of water that we had at planting time after we filled the profile. So we started we had different pumping capacities. Based on the pumping capacity, we started that pre-plant irrigation earlier in the growing season. Had three different irrigation systems in this. Uh, this was a surface, or not surface, but spray irrigation. This was LEPA on this side right here. This, in this plot, was subsurface drip. So we had three different delivery systems, uh, several replicated plots, profile. This was a five-foot profile depth uh, our reference ET that occurred from mid-March through the 1st of May was 9 inches. In other words, in our environmental demand, high wind speeds, low relative humidity, was 9 inches during that 6 to 7 week time period. We'd applied 4 inches of subsurface drip. We had rainfall. We assumed that our profile was full. In fact, we had water coming out the bottom of it. We didn't wet up all of it. Water was going down as, a, as opposed to lateral uh, movement. Our change in soil water content from the beginning, beginning of this period to the end of it was only four inches. In other words, we had about uh, eight inches of water coming into the system. We could only account for about half of that. This was subsurface drip. This is a summary of that three-year study. With spray systems over the three years, uh, our average water that we could, uh, we could not account for was 67%. LEPA was 60%, 47% 40, for subsurface drip. We couldn't account for that with our measurements. From this, as we continued to grow the crop during the growing, rest of the growing season, 
We felt like that we could easily say that subsurface drip is more efficient in terms of water delivery than LEPA or spray. It increased yield in this study uh, over spray from 21 to 59 percent, and that depends upon the pumping capacity. The higher pumping capacity, the less differences in the, those efficiencies. Uh, if you have low pumping capacity, you have a higher difference. Between uh, subsurface drip and LEPO is a 5 to 29 percent increase in yield, the same quantity of water. Okay, we'll shift gears just a little bit. <clears throat> Um, what we wanted to do now was then start looking at irrigations during the growing season and look at dividing the year up into <coughs> multiple time periods. Um, in this case, we did it three time periods, and we want to look at the water productivity within each of those time periods. This again was on cotton. Um, and again, the question is, oops. Back up here just a second. Uh, when do you use available water? You know, possible volume restrictions. How much yield is given up in cotton when you divert water from one crop to another? Depends on the price variation of the commodities. We saw in 11 and in 12, water was pulled from cotton over to corn due to the price difference. Uh, what is the effect of well capacity during, uh, with its decline during the growing season? In other words, you're expecting two tenths of an inch per day all season long. If it falls off later in the year, what effect does that have on, on your pr productivity? So those are the types of questions we were uh, looking to try to answer. We want to determine water use efficiency during different cotton growth periods, and ultimately we want to improve irrigation recommendations for limited irrigation. The two factors are in-season irrigation periods and irrigation capacity. That's the pivot that we used to do the experiment on. Uh, we divided the, the growing period into three periods. This red line represents a water use curve for cotton. We had uh, the first period was a, a vegetative period for cotton. We ran this up to about 950 heat units. From planting to 950 heat units represented that first period. The second period was a uh, reproductive period. It goes up to about 1,350 heat units. And the third period is a maturation period. So we arbitrarily divided that growing season up into those periods on cotton. The irrigation capacities or irrigation levels that we applied at those periods were three. The first one was what we call low. And it was very low at zero. So no water was applied. The second irrigation capacity was what we call medium. And you'll see M is an abbreviation. That was uh, an eighth of an inch per day rate. Now, we didn't apply an eighth of an inch per day, it was just that rate. So we irrigated uh, uh, every four days, then we applied a half an inch every four days. That, back up just a second. Uh, that represented about 2.36 gallons per minute per acre. That's about a 300 gallon a minute quarter mile pivot. And then uh, and our high irrigation capacity was twice that rate, about a quarter of an inch per day. Okay, we took all the different combinations of those two factors, the factorial setup. So we had some treatments where we had high water at the beginning, uh, medium amount of water at the end, and then high water at the, at the, at the end. Some we had uh, low water at the beginning, mm -hmm. medium water at the middle, and you know high. You know, all the different combinations that round up, wound up being 27 different irrigation regimes or treatments out in this field. These are all replicated under this pivot. Uh, the acronym that we used for these treatments is kind of important because I'm going to show you some pictures here of some of these plots. This LMH treatment meant that uh, uh, the first period we had low 
or no water up to about 950 heat units. The second period was a medium pumping capacity. So it'd be like having a 300 gallon a minute quarter mile pivot during that reproductive period. The high was twice that rate. It's like having dumping another well in that pivot and, and bumping the rate up. So that was LMH treatment as an example. This is a picture of that system. Um, like last year, this was I think in 2012, you can see the differences in, in levels of stress on the, these different plots. Uh, these plots were eight rows wide, about 100, at least 100 feet long, um, scattered out across about a 10 acre uh, pivot area. Monthly rainfall over the four years of the test. Ten was pretty good. Eleven was pretty tough. Twelve, we had a couple of rainfall events that wound up in the Playa Lake, and essentially, uh, we I saw there was more water in the Playa Lakes that year than I'd seen in about 15 years after that June rain. Um, didn't get any of it in the ground. Uh, this year, uh, we had some pretty good rain in June. July, of course, everybody knows that was just tremendous, uh, the timing of that rainfall. Took some pictures in each of these years prior to harvest. So this was prior to harvest. This was a LLL treatment, no water during the growing season uh, in 11. And I'm not too sure how Joe wound up coming up with 29 pounds per acre on that, running that stripper through there. But anyway, we got a number. Uh, I want to show you some contrasting pictures now. Uh, this was last year. The same, same treatment, same plots. Uh, we had uh, probably six inches or so, six or seven inches of rain during the growing season was the difference between 11 and, and uh, 13 and about uh, 500 pound yield on that. All right, this is that uh, MMM treatment in 2011. This was, again, uh, similar to having a 300 gallon a minute quarter mile pivot uh, where we turned the water on in June and watered through August. Um, it applied about 10 inches of water, made about 400 pounds of lint, which for that year wasn't too terrible. All right, we'll look at uh, this past year. And this, again, is uh, the difference what the rainfall made, that uh, extra six or seven inches of rain. Um, again, same 10 inches, nearly 1,200 pounds of lint. All right, the next few slides I want to show. I want you to understand what what may be happening uh, is that we're applying water early in the growing season in an attempt to build profile water early in the growing season so that we'll have it in August. And what this shows is that we're not getting very much of that water in the ground. Now this is the MMM treatment. All right, this next one is the LMM treatment for last year, where we didn't apply water up to 950 heat units. So we applied three inches less than that previous slide, had a slightly lower yield, not much lower, and then the same thing is true. We'll go back and look at the HHH treatment. This is 2011, high water. We put on about 18 inches of uh, irrigation water, wound up with uh, 860 pounds of lint. This is last year, same treatment, three bale, a uh, little bit less water. All right, again, we're, the next series will be reducing the amount of water we're putting on on that front period. This MHH treatment 
you know, reducing the amount of water here. We actually increased lint yield. And this is a LHH treatment. Again, reducing the amount of water on that total water we applied and still having pretty decent yields. Now, well, you say, well, we had rain in June. Well, we did. And that, that accounts for, for some of that. But if you go back and look at all of the four years of data, this trend holds true. We're, we're having a hard time getting in any advantage at all of putting water on, at least in this, this specific site, using a LEPA to store water in the profile that we can get at in August. <clears throat> this summarizes that data for four year for that four year period. This is yield, lint yield, 27 different treatments. The colors represent that component of yield contributed by an irrigation level at a certain time. So this blue represents the yield that we got from the rainfall in that early season or pre-plant irrigation averaged over the four years. So we got about uh, a little, nearly 400 pounds of lint. If we turned the water off, we planted and didn't water any anymore, averaged over the four years. The red represents that component of yield that we attributed to the water that was applied during that first period, up to 950 heat units. In other words, we watered to 950 heat units, turned the water off. That was the resulting yield, averaged over four years. The yellow <clears throat> represents the second time period and the purple represents that third time period. So our biggest part of our yield occurred from that water contribution that occurred during that third period. That's where we're seeing the highest water value. Now we can't gain water value in that third period unless we've got a cotton plant in the first place. But the point is trying to build water, fill that profile early in the growing season in the environment that we've got, we're not getting full benefit from that water. This is another, this is a subset of that earlier slide. Four treatments, we're comparing this LLL, which is basically a dry land treatment, to the LHH, MHH, and HHH. So we're changing the amount of water that we put on during that first time period. This is data averaged over the four year time period. If we go and apply water uh, after nine, 950 heat units, uh, middle of July through August here, our yield average was about uh, 1,250 pounds and we're getting about 80 pounds of lint per acre inch of water applied. For that 11 inches of water applied, we're getting about 80 pounds of lint. We increase the amount of water that we applied totally uh, by adding water on the front end, trying to store some of that water, growing a bigger plant, a couple more inches over there. You can see that our return for that water is considerably less than this. We are getting an increase in yield by applying water on the front end but our return is less. In this high water, uh, you can see we're getting very little return from that. Jim, yes, sir. Can I ask you a question? Certainly. Physiologically, cotton plant, your first one, your, your first segment mm -hmm. during the growing season, um, that would be from emergence to 950 heat, heat units to be right at first square, somewhere around there. Uh, it'll be past that. It will be in uh, bloom. In bloom, early bloom. Yeah. So did you start your water in emergence and distribute it all the way from that time, from emergence all the way into bloom? Or did On you those that we irrigated? Yes. No. We started, at, well, we ran a water balance. And, of course, we didn't start watering until into June. Okay. Let the, start, let the plant establish itself. We didn't want to, you know, disease problems and a whole, a whole 
uh, ball of wax. Uh, but we started uh, typically, we would put instrumentation in, you know, got the crop established, but it was typically, the earliest we started was uh, probably the 10th of June. Okay. Did you allow your water balance to deplete before you started watering? The water balance was typically depleted. I mean, in other words, we didn't have a profile full when we planted. So, so we had a big bucket. So anytime we started watering, we had plenty of room in the bucket to, to add water. Now, you need to understand too that when I, when I say we're not, we're, we want to, in this test, we didn't have any water applied during that first time period. We're not saying that that plant needs to suffer. In other words, we need to have, that plant needs to, needs to uh, and here again, I'm not a plant physiologist, and you guys probably know cotton as well or better than I do, but uh, we're not trying, what we're trying not to do is push a lot of water down in the profile. We need to keep the plant happy, but the plant doesn't need much water in that first period. The surface area of those leaves is small. It doesn't need much water. Right. So the, the, the whole gist of this is that although we think, and here again it depends on the soil type, it depends on the irrigation system, uh, this is site specific to a large degree. If you can have a full profile, that is very good. Um, but the point is that sometimes we assume because we've got that irrigation system running that we're putting water in the ground. And that's, from this, that's not always the appropriate <coughs> assumption. How much were you applying for each cycle? Each irrigation? Yeah. Typically about a half an inch. We had LEPA, we had dikes. We didn't want to over top the dikes. When you put on half an inch, we're talking about an inch going in that instead of, you know, we're concentrating in a smaller area. So it wasn't a big irrigation. Um, granted, if you, if you had the, the slope and the soil type to put on a heavier irrigation, you'd be much better off. And then your second cycle, your second regime mm -hmm. would be from flower to um, past peak bloom, I saw. Yes, this typically we're going to from, uh, from crop establishment through um, probably the uh, second week in July, maybe a little bit later than that, and then the second regime would go into probably the first week of August. It'd probably be August the 6th through the 8th is when we made that transition. This is the same slide at the lower irrigation capacity in the similar type results. This is a kind of an inverse of that other slide. Here we're, here we're, we're changing the amount of water we're putting on, the, on that last growth period, going from LLL to HHL, HHM, and HHH. We're adding more water towards the bottom, back end. Uh, these nine inches of water, uh, when we didn't apply water in that third period, uh, it was 27 pounds per acre inch. Not, not very good return. As we add more water to the end, we increase the, the amount of value of that water at the end of the growing season. So we're fighting two things. One is we've got a decline in pumping capacity during the growing season. That's when we need the water, at the end of the growing season. Um, part of the decline in the pumping capacity is maybe due, it depends upon the location and the, and the uh, uh, makeup of the aquifer at your particular location, uh, 
but we may be over pumping in the front end, reducing our pumping cast capacity early, you know, early in the growing season and not having that water available later in the growing season. And then this is the same slide at that lower uh, pumping capacities, the M, MMM treatments. Uh, Tim can build profile water early in the growing season with center pivot, reduces irrigation water value based on this experiment. Uh, I think we're seeing two things. One, we're seeing um, high evaporative losses. The other thing that we are seeing, and we've worked with uh, uh, Glenn Ritchie at Tech on doing some uh, uh, physiological measurements, we're seeing that we're growing too big a plant. We're growing a plant that we can't support in August. In other words, when we try when we overwater early, we have a structure that would support three, four bale cotton that we can't support with the water that we've got available in August. I want to run through this right quick. This is a little bit on subsurface drip. Rules were three, three different uh, intervals. One was once every quarter day. In other words, we irrigated once every six hours. Uh, we've got another treatment where we irrigated two days, once every two days. That changed to once every one day. So when you see this in, our, in the data or in the uh, uh, results where it shows once every two days, we change from two days to one day after uh, the second year. And then we irrigated once every seven days. Uh, the irrigation quantities were fairly good, about 80% of the evaporative demand and then half of that rate. So two different irrigation levels. Uh, alternate row, uh, this was 30 inch crop rows, uh, laterals were 60 inches apart. This was not a small plot test. This is a quarter mile length runs. This is over to Helms Farm, uh, more of a production type setup. We had lateral depths, eight inch, it was very shallow. Uh, this uh, greatly assisted in uh, getting better germination. We ran this for four years at fairly decent rainfall during uh, the growth period 11, uh, 2012. Here again, this is all the Playa Lake water there. Harvested that. This is the data from that. Over this, this is an average of the four years. This surprised me. Now, the low irrigation rate, I would have assumed during some of these really dry periods that this yield would, would have been significantly less than a more frequent irrigation with drip. And that's what I had assumed would have happened, but we didn't see that. And we particularly didn't see it during these dry years. This is a higher water level, higher yield. Our seven day interval was significantly higher yield, averaged over the over the four year period, then the very, very frequent and the two day interval. And I think what we're seeing is simply the, the fact, and, and really the, the big difference was in these, these dry years. It didn't hurt us in the, in the uh, more the wetter years. Uh, these dry years, putting on more water per application, uh, really resulted in a very, very significant increase in yield. Attribute that to the, simply to the fact that uh, we're getting a, a bigger root mass in a larger percentage of the profile. And we're probably, and we had uh, soil moisture monitoring in that, we, we uh, could not uh, visually see that with our measurement, but I felt like we were harvesting whatever water was in that bigger area um, as opposed to where we're irrigating more frequently our root zone was tied directly to that uh, cross-sectional area immediately around that drip tape and we weren't uh, uh, didn't have near the volume of water to be near the volume to be pulling water and nutrients from so uh, that was a little bit of a surprise for me 
A uh, seven day interval did not reduce lint yield um, compared to the more frequent irrigations, didn't reduce fiber quality. So, with the pivot irrigation, how much pre water, what's the minimum amount of pre water we can get away with? Well, again, our goal in that experiment was to try to wet up the top 18, 18 to 24 inches to where we could plant on moisture. It's really a function of, of uh, how much water there is in that, in that profile. Um, you know, in this, if you've plowed the ground and you've, you've dried that top surface out, uh, a lot of times with the winds that we've had and with no moisture at all, we're, that profile on the upper foot to even maybe a little bit deeper may be so dry that it's, you know, it's drier than wilting point. So you've got to, you know, if you think you've got a, uh, you know, two inches per foot of water holding capacity in that, in that soil, say, or water available uh, for plants, you may dry it out below that, so you may need three inches of water to bring it up to field capacity because it's, it's oven dried. So, uh, really, it's uh, uh, I think it's somewhat site specific. I think uh, uh, it really depends. It depends on on what you're you're comfortable with. But uh, um, I don't know. I guess I'm I'm a little bit of a, uh, a gambler, or to the extent that that you can gamble a little bit, you don't want to gamble with everything. So it's very very uh, important I think where you've got uh, area under a pivot that you don't have enough water for that pivot that you irrigate pre-water you know a good portion of that if you can another portion you may uh, slack off a little bit and the rest of it you may leave as non-irrigated so you know hedge your bets. Is the row space is all 30s and 40s? Yeah yeah uh, I definitely think uh, a lot uh, having residue, having ability to to rotate with other crops is a is a big benefit. Um, or you've got some residue, uh, limited till, no till type situations um, help. Uh, a higher density where you get uh, uh, or closer row spacings where you get uh, your ground shaded earlier in the growing season definitely helps. Um, you get the canopy cover to cover the ground uh, is, a, is a big benefit. Um, but yeah, we're, we're on 30s and 40s. Uh, again, we're talking about germination. This is that same field. Uh, this had drip under every 40 inch row. Um, you know, germination can be tough. We did some work uh, well, this is 2011, where we, where we did uh, this little study for a couple of years, where we looked at uh, timing of pre-plant irrigations, where we slugged water on and then applied a moderate rate of water uh, up until planting date. And then we had another treatment where we had a moderate rate up until planting date and then continued watered on. And then another treatment where we slugged it on right before planting to see if we could improve uh, germination. What was the depth of these tapes? This tape was probably 12 to 14 inches in depth. Uh, this is 2011. Um, this is alternate furrow drip. We didn't get a very, very good stand. It's pretty, pretty pathetic, <coughs> pretty ugly. Uh, we went ahead and watered that a tenth of an inch per day rate. And our ugly drip cotton. Uh, wound up making about 900 pounds of lint per acre. I think we, we had uh, probably, not counting the pre-plant irrigation, which a lot of that was wasted, but we probably put on uh, uh, probably seven or eight inches on during the growing season. We put the seven or eight inches on the pivot that year adjacent to this and some other treatments. Uh, we had good stand under the pivot, 
but our yield was about 500, a little bit less, a little bit more than half of this rate uh, with the same amount of water. So our, our ugly drip harvested the water um, that we did get in the ground a lot better than the pivot. Another thing that we tried in 11 was uh, we had abandoned an experiment uh, because we couldn't get germination, decided to go in in June and plant directly over that drip lateral. Uh, this is cotton. To just see if we could get germination. And we did. And this is how it looked uh, in July. And of course, this is June planted cotton. We wound, wound up making about 900 pounds of lint. This is on 60-inch uh, row cotton. Our laterals were 60 inches apart. So we were able to, to uh, uh, still make a yield in a, in a dry year with drip. Uh, germination, you can, you can uh, do it. Um, well, germination is assured by planting directly over the drip tape. And the question became, how long do you wait for rain to improve germination with a traditional planting scheme? In other words, we've been in a situation on one of our fields where we can't get germination even in a normal rainfall year. Turn the drip on, we water, we water, we water, we water. Put too much water on pre-plant irrigation with drip, trying to get water up in the in the beds. So I was thinking, well, instead of sitting there and waiting until the first of June to plant, and then maybe not having a good stand, how much am I giving up by not going ahead and planting in a timely fashion in May? directly over that drip lateral and getting a good stand and growing a crop. Uh, we tried that in 2012. This is a replicated test. Uh, we got a little rain uh, in 12. Got a fairly decent stand where we had rows planted in a traditional sense versus alternate. Uh, pretty good difference in yield there. And then uh, this past year, Uh, we did this on a larger field at about 20 acres we encompassed. This is our traditional planting. Uh, drip laterals between each of those rows. A little bit uh, skippy stand, not too bad. This is where we planted directly over that lateral. This was planted uh, about uh, May the 25th. Again, we were in a situation where we were waiting for rain or waiting, trying to get uh, enough moisture in the ground to, to plant on with the traditional. Decided to pull the trigger and just plant half and half. Uh, this is that field traditional planting later in the year. This is this past year. Uh, this is uh, planting directly over those laterals and harvest. And then this was a difference last year. A uh, little bit better yield on every row versus skip row. But again, we planted a little bit later than maybe what we would like to have planted. We did plant on the skip row about uh, five to ten percent more seed per uh, uh, per foot of row than uh, the every row. So, you know, going into this year, on where we've got alternate row drip, one of the things that we will be looking at on one of our tests, we're just going to abandon the concept of of uh, 30 inch rows. We're going to plant directly over that that uh, lateral and probably not apply but minimal pre-plant and then turn the water on see if we can germinate that planting fairly early. Um, so that may be uh, you can use in a drip field if you're having problems with germination. On the drip, which way did you show the best uh, germination? You put a large amount of water at the first, or didn't you, didn't 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 have any difference? Didn't make any difference. Is it better to go list or just flat on the pivot? We list um, 
primarily because a lot of the work that we're doing is smaller plots and we put dikes in it to hold water and we need a distinction between one area and another so we're trying to hold water in place so we know exactly what's going on. Uh, we, but uh, again I think it's, it's a soil type it also a uh, function of uh, economics you know uh, uh, you know running big big equipment big planters big spray rigs you know that's uh, um, you know the, the bottom line is the dollars per acre and you may give up a little water efficiency to gain convenience but the uh, you know as we run out of water that the, the price of that convenience goes up so it's, it's a continuing balancing act and uh, If this year shapes up to be like 11, what would you do with your water? Well, we've we had we've had that <laughs> we've had that discussion. We just had a big meeting, well, meeting in Lubbock uh, with the research group on how to handle research priorities. We're sitting there, the same boat that everybody else is. You know, we assume we can irrigate so many acres. We've got contracts to do research grants for so many acres. And we can't do it. We've got to prioritize and, and shrink shrink that down. We will uh, we'll reduce the area that we'll we'll be doing tests on. We will uh, uh, again the strategy on pre-plant. We'll be applying enough to get the thing get the plant up and going. Our high rainfall months are April, May, June. We're we're gambling that we'll we'll get some of that rain, but we're not gambling 100 percent. We're going to put some water out. Uh, I mean, all all you guys know. I mean, I my dad was a farmer, and I grew up on a farm. It's 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 gamble. It's tough. <laughs>